data set shift is a condition that my model behaves very strong on the training data, but not as good on the test data. And the reason why that might happen is because let's just say I have a set of images and I train my model on all these images and it works good. But at inference time, something happens. Let's just say the weather becomes different, it becomes rainy, and since the model has not seen any images with the rainy data, then it might not behave very strong. Or let's just say the camera that is recording the image might become old and the image's captures might be cropped at, let's just say, a blurry or noisy. So the question that we can ask ourselves is, can we adapt our model to these variations and corruptions and have a model to be robust against all these corruptions? And the answer is yes. We have a method called TENT from ICLR 2021 that it proposes a method that tries to increase the test time accuracy without relying on any annotations. So let's just see how this works. The paper first says, let's just say we have some source data and this is what we initially use for training. And then we have some target data that doesn't necessarily have the same distribution as the source data. As an example, we can kind of consider source data as the ImageNet pre-training and target data as a downstream task that we want to use it for semantic segmentation, object detection, pose estimation, and so on. That in all the cases, we have a different distribution than the source data, which was the ImageNet for classification. The other case could be the difference that I just mentioned that might happen because of the corruptions, like a bad weather or a noisy image that make the target data different than the source data. And our goal is just to align these two distributions so that the model behave good in all these two cases. And an easy approach to do this is fine tuning that we all know for transfer learning that we don't really care what source data is, we just pre-train it with some ImageNet and then on the target data, we have some input xt with the corresponding label yt, and then we define a loss function l that kind of tries to map this xt to yt. And we do it on the training for a couple epochs, and we are good to go. We do not modify anything on the test data. But that's not the only approach to do. There, there is another approach called the data adaptation that on the training, it looks at the source data and as this loss function that tries to map the input xs to the label ys. But in addition, we have some target data that we don't necessarily have any labels for it. But what it tries to do instead is add another loss function that tries to adapt the domain of xs and xt. And by this adaptation, the model kind of consider both of these two inputs as the same and we expect it to behave strong also on the target data. One example of this, I guess, could be contrastive learning, that the target data could be the noisy image of the source data, and we want to make the source data and target data to be similar while contrast them with the other samples and push them into different area of the space. But anyway, that's the domain adaptation, but there are some scenarios that we train the model and then we implement it and at the test time we see that the performance sometimes becomes worse and we want our model to continuously adapt itself to the new environment and makes itself better and better and that is test time training and in test time training we have some source data and a target data for the target data we don't have any label because that's actually happening at inference time and the thing that they do is that at the test time, they add another loss function that only considers the input that it's seeing at the inference time. But to make this test time training work, we need to modify the training and add this loss function that does the same thing that we are doing at the test time, but on the source data on the training time. And the reason they do it is just to make this loss function compatible between the training and the testing. It is a useful thing to do. So let's just say I have some model with some source data. I just need to add this loss function at the training. And once I implement it somewhere, I can continuously add the loss function on the test time so as to make it better and better and better. But what's the issue? The issue is that not all the time we have access to the source data. Let's just say the source data is just some private data that we have and the model is already pre-trained on it. We have the ways for the model, 
but not the actual data. Or sometimes the source data is very large scale and we don't really have the computation resource to train it all again by adding this loss function at the training. So that's where the tent comes and it proposes fully test time adaptation that we don't really care about the source data. All we care is that at the test time, we apply some loss function so as to increase the accuracy. Hopefully all the differences make sense. Now let's just see what they do to apply this loss function at the test time to increase the accuracy. They initially do some analysis that we can see on this figure that they pick C4100 dataset, they make it corrupted by applying lots of severe noises and any sort of corruptions that you can guess, I think. But the thing that they notice is that once we have this corrupted images and give it to the model and assess the entropy and also the error rate, we see some correlations that as we decrease the entropy, the error rates becomes lower and lower. So that's an interesting finding. But in addition, they have another figure that you can see that they have applied different sorts of corruptions, like adding noise on the red color or blue on the blue color or different weather conditions on the purple and digital, which I'm not sure what that is, to be honest. But the thing that is interesting is that they have applied it with different levels of severity. But one thing that we can also see here is that as we increase the severity of these corruptions, the entropy and loss function, both of them become higher. So that also shows that there are some correlations between the loss and the entropy. So here comes the idea. Why not just reduce the entropy at the test time so as to decrease the error rate and the loss value? Seems easy, right? And that is TENT or test entropy minimization. And we can define an entropy with this formula that we have some yc hat, which is the output of the model. We calculate the probability and then give it to this formula to calculate the entropy. And we want to minimize it as easy as that. But to be honest, it's not as easy as that because if I apply this entropy on a single data at test time, there is some trivial solution that the model might collapse. Let's just say I have a scenario which I'm going to do image classification and I have five classes and I have a single image at the test time that says I give you 80% probability that it belongs to class one. If I want to minimize the entropy only on this one single test data, the thing that happens is that it tries to increase the 80% to 100% and all the other ones to 0% and says, yeah, doing this I can have the minimum entropy but that's not what we want because that simply says that regardless of what input that I receive I always classify it as class 1 which minimizes the entropy that's not what we want is it so it kind of to tackle this issue they say we need to optimize it based on the batch of data but here comes my question that what if in that batch of data I also have a scenario that all of them belong to class one and I want to minimize entropy. And I guess in that case, the class one goes to 100%, all the others to zero, and it should be problematic. What do you think? If you know the answer, feel free to add it on the comment. I'll be happy to read it. But anyway, this is the mod collapse. But this is not the only issue that we might have. The other issue is that the model parameters are the only representation of the training or source data. And modifying the model parameters itself could be dangerous. Why dangerous? Because as they say, at the test time, it might change the distribution of the data and cause the model to diverge from its training. And in my opinion, what that means is, let's just say the embedding of our model is only in two dimension and it can classify three different classes on the source data. Clearly, we can have some decision boundary just to differentiate these three classes. But on the target data, since we are having some data set shift, it might not be as easy as that. And we might have some scenarios like this. What entropy minimization tries to do is that it tries to make the model more confident to give a probability score for a single class. 
and that should be equivalent of making those separated clusters, I believe. So by applying this entropy minimization at test time, it tries to create some sort of clusters that within cluster classes are very close to each other while further away from the other classes. But the thing is, if I do it much, then the decision boundary I already have from the training data cannot really distinguish these different data values. And there has been a paper from the May 2024 called Entropy Enigma, which actually mentions this issue. But anyway, in this paper, they say modifying the model parameters makes it more likely for us to come across this issue. And they try to kind of mitigate it. And what they propose is that instead of updating the model parameters, let's just do something else. And the thing that they do is that they say, we have a loss function to be the minimization of entropy, right? Let's now, instead of modifying the parameters based on this loss function, modify the normalization values. So they say, we have some input and we can apply this normalization that we can subtract by some mean and then divide by some standard deviation, which we can do it by applying this formula but the values of the mean and the standard deviation comes from the average and variance of the target data. That is totally irrelevant of the entropy loss function that we defined, but the thing that we should learn based on this loss function is the parameters gamma and beta. And once we normalize the data input that we have, we multiply it by a gamma, which rescales the data, and shift it with a parameter beta. So we have a formula like this, and the parameters gamma and beta are defined by this loss function that we defined by minimizing the entropy. So by minimizing the entropy, we update the parameters gamma and beta, and we only rescale and shift the data distribution, and not more. And yeah, that's the whole idea that they have. Does it work? Well, yeah, otherwise it, it wouldn't be a paper, right? And you can see one of the results in this table that they have applied it on C410 and C4100. They make it corrupted and you see that on the source one, on the first row, the error rate becomes 40.8% on the C410 and 67.2% on C4100 dataset. But, but, but by applying this tens just to minimize the entropy, it becomes 14% and 37% and beats all the other models that was previously proposed. And they have done also lots of experiments on the also on the ImageNet and also on other data sets, which I'm not gonna talk about this in this video just because that just makes it longer and longer. And you can read it if interested, the paper is mentioned in the comment. And yeah, that's all I wanted you to know about this paper. If you enjoyed watching this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. And until the next video, goodbye.